Welcome to this week's episode of Inside the Headset presented by CoachCon. This week, we sit down with Jay Norvell, the head coach at Colorado State University. In this conversation, Coach Norvell takes us through the journey he took to get to where he is today, his experiences in both high-level college football and the NFL, and the people that helped him grow throughout his career. But first, a word from CoachCon. Deuce left, check with me. If they're in quarters match, we're going to Pittsburgh or Ohio. They're in zero, they're in zero. Let's go hippo Seattle wide choice. If we call the protection right, it's six. When a play call is the difference between winning and losing, your headset choice could be your most important decision. When the call counts, CoachCom is the only choice for clear, dependable communication. Visit CoachCom.com for more info. We got it, guys. Good job. Now, let's get inside the headset with Coach Norvell. Coach Norvell, what's going on? How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing good. I'm excited about having you on. Uh, always been a fan of yours as a as a young receiver coach, and to 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 be on with you is uh, definitely definitely my privilege, man. So I'm I'm excited about diving in with you. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> well, honor. well, let's not leave anybody waiting here. Uh, uh, I I. I I never would have guessed that uh <laughs> that, that you were a DB guy as 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 I've always known you as a wide receiver coach <laughs> and as you, yeah. you I know everybody else knows you just as a ball coach but uh played DB at Iowa uh uh spent a season with the Chicago Bears at what point in time in your high school collegiate professional career did you decide you want to be a part of this great profession That's a great question you know it really happened early on um from my earliest memories I lived across the street from my school and I'd go over to the schoolyard and uh, like a lot of young kids, I would pretend like I was going to play in the National Football League and be a pro football player. But I also, I always had high regard for coaches and my dad was a coach for a little while. I always looked up to my dad and uh, and so at a young age, I always imagined myself not only playing, but someday coaching. But it wasn't until um, I got released. Uh, I was actually from the Denver Broncos. Um, I was a defensive back. I was a big, slow, all Big Ten DB <laughs> safety, and they, they wanted to make me a linebacker. And I, I was just too light. So I went to the Broncos, and Dan Reeves was the coach, and I got released in camp. I went back to Iowa, and I was walking on the street, and I saw three of my coaches. I saw Barry Alvarez and Dan McCarney and and uh, Bernie Wyatt, who was three great coaches, and and they just they said, "What are you doing?" And I said, "I don't know. I was work. I was going to go work in a video store and and try out again." And they said, "You ought to come down and and be a graduate assistant. We got a spot open and see Coach Fry." And so I did that. And those guys just took me under my wing. You know, I was really fortunate to have great college coaches and they really, they changed my life, my association with them. Yeah. So, uh, a, a little bit removed from actually playing there at Iowa, you, you, you get this opportunity. What was kind of in that transition? What was eye opening for you? Uh, I know a lot of times we, I know at least for me, I just didn't realize how much manpower hour hours you spend you know on film oh, yeah. and cut ups and all that you kind know, of stuff so so i think it's a great lesson for all of us in this profession but some of the the coaches that impacted me the most were not my direct coach like i had a great coach uh bill brazier was the defensive coordinator at iowa he coached the secondary and and when I was in school at Iowa, I played strong safety. And in our meeting room, we sat by position. So, you know, it was the corner, the strong safety, the free safety, the corner, the starter sat in front, and the second team, the third team, the fourth team. Anyway, I played strong safety, and I sat um, behind Bob Stoops and then Mike Stoops and then myself. And then Mark Stoops was behind me. So all four of us ended up being head coaches. And I just think it says a lot about the education we got at Iowa on how to coach. And, but, but Barry Alvarez was the first one to take me under his wing as a graduate assistant. And I worked with linebackers and I just really started to learn the nuts and bolts of coaching and, 
you know, doing formation hit lists and knowing where the ball was going to hit by and building tendencies by formations. And that really gave me the first uh, really insight on what it took to be a coach. Uh, Listen that kind of that depth chart that you just listed there with the, with the Stoops brothers. And then, you know, you mentioned you're walking down the street and you see Barry Alvarez and Dan Carney. And then they're yeah. telling you to go talk to Hayden Fry. Like this, this is like the who's who of the profession. And obviously at that time you have no idea, right? That these guys right. are just going to go on to be, be these legendary coaches. What, you know, having to touch, even on the Stoops, although they're, you know, they're, they're around your age or whatnot, what, what impact did that have just been around some of these just monumental guys in this profession? You know, I just, I just think uh, the impact that I had at Iowa and coach Fry and all the people that he attracted, it just, and we tell players all the time now is that it's the people that you're surrounded by that are going to affect the rest of your life. And when I was at Iowa, you know, coach Fry said, to me, he said, if you want the players to win, you have to surround them with winners. And so, you know, I wish I had a picture of that staff in front of me, but it was, it was a, it was an all star staff. I mean, yeah. Bill Snyder was our offensive coordinator. Kurt Ferentz was a 25 year old line coach when I first went to Iowa. And obviously he's, you know, done an amazing job at Iowa over these years after Coach Fry left. Um, but those, you know, then, then on defense, you had Bill Brazier was an amazing coach, but, but Barry Alvarez was, ended up being a great Wisconsin coach. Dan McCarney went to Iowa State. Um, and then the Stoops brothers, you know, Bob and Mike and Mark. Um, there was just, you know, Brett Bielma was there as well. We, there's just so many guys that came out of that coach fry tree. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when I became a head coach at Nevada, Coach Fry was still alive. He called me and he said, Jay, he says, I just got a call uh, from the AFC, I believe it was, he said, and, and uh, that his coaching tree had more head coaches than any coach that they had on record, more than Bobby Bowden uh, and and uh, Bear Bryant. So, you know, I'm just very proud of my IRA roots and the people that I was associated with. And Really, it's it's had the biggest effect on me as a coach. You know, we're everywhere I've been. I've been a part of developmental teams where you you sign smart people, people that have toughness and work ethic, yeah. and you train them to be really good players, and you train them to be a team. And that's had the biggest effect on me as a coach. Well, that's that's an awesome start. Just to, even before starting, just to be around some of those guys. Now, uh, you mentioned you you started that GA opportunity off at, at, at the linebacker position. You know, you were dabbling with it clearly in the NFL uh, as they were trying to make you have that transition there. Uh, but at some point, you make a bigger transition to offense. Did that happen while you were a GA there at Iowa? Yeah. So, so my my path was, um, you know, I worked with with Coach Alvarez. Um, as a GA, I also trained that year, and I did get bigger and stronger. And so then I went to the Chicago Bears uh, for okay. two years, and and so and I actually played linebacker with the Bears, um, and that was another great experience I had. I, you know, Mike Dick signed me, um, but I that was right after they had won the World Championship eighty seven and eighty eight. It was Walter Payton's last year. Um, in 87. So I got to spend around time around Walter. Um, but, it, 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 you know, I played behind three great linebackers. You know, Wilbur Marshall was the Will linebacker. Mike Singletary was the Mike and, and Otis Wilson was the Sam. And, and the backups, there was a guy named Jim Morrissey that played behind Otis Wilson. Um, Ron Rivera played behind Mike Singletary. And then I played behind Wilbur Marshall. And so, and played special teams. So it was really just an amazing time to be with that team with so many great players. And I got to spend two years there when after those two years, I knew my time in the NFL was going to run out. And Barry Alvarez went to Notre Dame as a linebacker coach and then as the defense coordinator. And so I, I told coach Alvarez, I said, I really want to get into coaching. And then after my two years with the Bears, I went to Notre Dame with Lou Holtz 
on Barry Alvarez as a graduate assistant. And, and that's where, you know, Coach Holtz had plans to move me on offense. And so, um, and, and I really didn't even make it to the season because I got a full time job at Northern Iowa, um, as a receivers coach. And so I always had played receiver and DB. Yeah. And so I was kind of a Swiss Army knife as a player and played a lot of different things. And so it was a natural transition for me to, to be, uh, work with the receivers. And, and so back in, uh, yeah, 1989, I went to Northern Iowa, uh, and then, you know, spent the rest, really the rest of my career coaching off. Yeah, that, that's I, – I, so I did not have the note that you actually went back to the league for a little bit and then uh, and spent that, uh, I guess, very short period. That that didn't pop up on my notes there at the Notre Dame yeah. stop. I guess because you didn't do a season per, uh, per se, right? Yeah, yeah that's so, correct. So you didn't do a season. And I was very fortunate. You know, I I got I, – I took the position as a graduate assistant. Notre Dame had just won the national championship, and I was really excited to be at Notre Dame with Coach Holt. But, you know, as a graduate, graduate assistant, your job is to get a full-time job. And so yeah. I got the chance to go to, to Northern Iowa, had a great year there. And then Barry Alvarez, the following year, took the Wisconsin job. And so, uh, again, Coach Alvarez, I went with him. And at that time, they had the volunteer position. And a lot of people don't remember that, but – I actually went to Wisconsin as the volunteer coach, but he gave me the receivers and I also worked special teams. And so my first year or so at Wisconsin, I was the volunteer assistant. And, um, you know, that always taught me a real lesson that I share with these young coaches. You know, when you're young in this profession, um, the most important thing, and Coach Alvarez always told me this, the most important thing is just to be around experienced people and learn. Yeah. And it's not necessarily, you know, how much money you make. It's not necessarily that you have a full-time position. It's get around quality people and learn, and, and it's going to benefit you in the long run. Now, uh, I, clearly Barry Alvarez is, is kind of monumental monumental in some of these early moves, right? These, some of these jobs that you're taking, uh, you know, he's, he's, he's definitely standing on the table for you. Now, the Northern Iowa, Northern Iowa deal, what was the connection there? How did that job kind of, kind of come about and what made you take it? Yeah, so, so obviously there was a connection there um, with the University of Iowa. Mm -hmm. And I think that my, my – my connection with Coach Fry and the Iowa staff really helped me have that opportunity at, at Northern Iowa, and and um, because I think the people there had high regard for the Iowa coaches, and they knew that I worked for Coach Fry and that staff, and they recommended me highly, and so that's that's how that opportunity came about. Um, you know, we had a great year there and, and, and then I had a chance to go to Wisconsin. I'm, I'm from Madison, Wisconsin. My yeah. dad played there. My brother played there. So I had some natural connections to that program as well. Right. And, um, spent five great years at Wisconsin, you know, ended up becoming the full time coach after the second year. Um, was given a chance to coach special teams, which I think was really, really beneficial for me as a coach you know um when i look at my career um i really think of myself as a football man you know um and understanding both sides of the ball understanding special teams and that track for me i think has really benefited me as a head coach because i i've coached offense i've played defense I coach special teams. I just have a broader understanding of problems that happen throughout the game. And then much, much, much later in my career, uh, I, I coached in the NFL for Al Davis and, and, and Al Davis made such an impact on me because he was a football man. I mean, he was a personnel guy. He was a former coach. He understood defense. He understood offense. And that's that's really what I take the most pride in for myself as a as a coach as a football man understanding the whole game. 
Absolutely. Yeah. But before the podcast, I kind of say, I, I always thought you were a receiver guy. You say, I'm a football guy. <laughs> and I, I love that response. Now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because I do have a note here. At some point in time in that five year stint there, Wisconsin, you did you do some offensive line to some capacity? No. So I don't know where that came. That was kind of a typo or something. But, oh, okay. But, 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 you know, I want to say this. Um, my five years at Wisconsin, um, I had incredible close associations with some great coaches. Mm-hmm. You know, on the offensive staff, um, you know, we had Bill Callahan and Brad Childress. And Brad was our offensive coordinator and Bill was our offensive line coach. And you talk about two amazing offensive minds. Both ended up becoming NFL head coaches. and. You know, we were doing some things back there in the early 90s with the inside zone game, and Bill Callahan was really at the top of his game. Um, and so that influenced me so much as a coach, working with Bill, understanding our run game. We were a West Coast passing team with Brad and his background from Illinois. And so those two influences really – affected me offensively and uh i really benefited from being around those two coaches that's awesome coach well after a five-year stay at your uh alma mater uh you you get the opportunity for for, for two years to go back to iowa but not 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 iowa <laughs> the university of iowa you yeah. go to iowa state uh how did that come about and then uh what was your kind of some of your unique takeaways from that that, that position yeah so i guess my path and i really look at this you know um being an offensive coach, you really aspire to work with the quarterbacks and the decision makers. And so um, when I was at Wisconsin, I really took advantage of, of the Bill Walsh minority internship. So we had a close relationship with the Packers. And so I used to go up and visit Mike Holmgren and Steve Mariucci and all the great offensive coaches at the Packers at that time. Actually, Andy Reid was there, um, and John Gruden was there. And so I spent time with all of those guys in the summertime, and I went up and and I did the minority internship, and I actually did it with Steve Mariucci and the quarterbacks. And so, you know, Brett Favre, Mark Brunel, and I knew that I wanted to coach quarterbacks. And so – that was a great education for me, spending time with, with Steve Mariucci. Um, and so I, I, I basically used that as a springboard to my move to Iowa State, and I coached quarterbacks and receivers with Dan McCarney for three years, and that just really, really helped my development as an offensive coach and eventually, you know, wanting to work to be a play caller. And so – that those years were really special to me at Iowa State with Dan, and uh, from there uh, I got an opportunity uh, from Jim Mora to go work with the Indianapolis Colts and coach wide receivers. Now, before we hop into to, to the NFL p- portion of uh, kind of your trajectory here through the profession, um, uh, let, let's pause it right there and, and then let me ask you a question: What which, which part of your career at this point in time has been? that biggest leap in growth of, of you been a ball coach, you know, what, what yeah. point so far? I, you know, I think, I think um, my years uh, at Wisconsin were great years because I was around some incredible football coaches that were so into ball, you know, and, and, and so I, I just kind of latched on to coach Bill Callahan and we, we were like, we were road buddies. I mean, we would go anywhere where anybody would talk ball to us, you know, and I, I would, I was really curious about the NFL. And so when I became uh, the special teams coordinator, coach, coach Alvarez, I jumped in the state car and I went over to the, the Detroit lions and, and the best special teams coach was a guy named Frank Gans. And I spent two weeks with Frank Gans just learning everything they do to, did in special teams. And then I brought it back to Wisconsin. And, and so we started doing a lot of professional things, spread punt in special teams. 
that really helped my development as a coach. And yeah. Barry gave me the, that leadership position to where I was in front of the team and had to speak to the team about the importance of special teams every week. And so I really grew as a coach there. The other thing, you know, Bill and I would go everywhere. We'd go to the Packers. We'd go to the Cowboys. Jimmy Johnson was coaching the Cowboys then. Anywhere we could go to learn and people would talk to us, we would go. And so I really grew as a coach. And I and I started to have this fascination about the National Football League from visiting all these people. And so I still have notes visiting the Eagles, visiting um, the Packers. And, and then that's where I got to meet John Gruden from with time in Green Bay. And so it just opened up this new world for me um, with relationships with Mariucci and Gruden and the people uh, that we've met in the NFL. Uh, you know, what I find interesting in that is, uh, you know, I'm trying to do some math in my head here. Uh, I, I would imagine you're 27, 28, 29 around this time. Is that is that about right? Yeah. Like, you know, yep. so a, a very young coach, you know, from from a professional standpoint, how 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 were you so, uh, I guess, eager and anxious to go out and get in your vehicle and go drive to the point to learn? Yeah. I mean, especially, I think this is great for coaches to hear these days and age because uh, – it's it's very easy to scroll through Twitter and see a little concept yeah. or you know all that kind of stuff, but I mean that's some dedication right there at that point in time. Well, I think I think Bill had a lot of of, of uh, you know Bill and and Brad Childress. You know they were young coaches at Illinois and worked for Mike White, and they just loved ball. You know, um, and I loved ball, and so um, and and I had this great resources. I mean, you know, you could get in a car and drive and, and see some of the best coaches in the game, you know, and for me being in Madison, that was Green Bay, that was Chicago, that was Detroit. Um, and then we even went up saw Dallas. Dallas was world champs. So, you know, me and Bill Callahan went to the Cowboys and spent time with them. Um, you know, and, and I think that that eagerness and you know, Bill and Bill taught me, you know, you don't ever go anywhere without coming back with a stack of notes. Yeah. You know, and so I still got, I mean, notebooks of notes from when I went to see the Packers, from when we sent to the Cowboys, when we spent time with John Gruden, when he went to the Eagles. Um, and so I just, I just was always curious that way. And it made me better as a coach. Yeah. Everything that I did on my own, um, helped me grow as a coach. And I met great coaches. Um, you know, I just, I, I'd sit in a meeting room with John Gruden and li let him listen to him coach the quarterbacks. And, you know, I, I sat in install meetings and watched John Gruden install offense. And those experiences were probably the biggest influences on me as a coach. And, um, you know, there's something magical when John Gruden stands in front of an offense install meeting and, and, and paints the picture of what a play should look like. Mm -hmm. And, you know, later on, I got a chance to be the coordinator and I, I really, my experiences watching John really, I, I took a lot from that. And, and, um, and so I can't, I can't emphasize enough how important those those trips were for me and my growth as a coach. And now, a quick word from Hater Athletic. Since 1954, Hater Athletic has been your trusted partner in football practice equipment. Handmade in the USA with care and dedication, our products are crafted to elevate your team's performance. But what truly sets us apart? It's our unwavering commitment to customer service. When you reach out, you'll be speaking to a real person with extensive product knowledge that prioritizes you getting your equipment fast. Experience the Hater difference today. Visit HaterAthletic.com and join the community of coaches who trust us for quality, reliability, and expertise. Hater Athletic. Four coaches. By coaches. Save 15% on your next order by using promo code AFCA2024 at checkout. Now, let's get back to the episode. Well, let's let's dive into that NFL portion of it. Obviously, uh, that was that was a huge part of your professional development. Um, and I'll kind of lump these two things together, just brag on you a little bit. Obviously, coach 
Hall of Famer, uh, um, one of the best to do it at the receiver position, Marvin Harrison, uh, for four years, and then um, an opportunity to, you know, at least be in the vicinity of one of the best to do it uh, from a play caller standpoint, and, and, and uh, uh, Peyton Manning, and then you 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 go to the Raiders and uh, coaching Super Bowl thirty seven, um, you know, work with Jerry Rice and Tim Brown, and Tim Brown, so. Just kind of coupling both of those things together, what what was special about that NFL experience, and what were some of the major differences um, th- that you liked and maybe didn't like from from that to the collegiate level? Yeah, I I loved my time in the NFL, and again, I was, you know, the thing that that you realize very quickly about being in the NFL is that, you know, I was with Jim Moore Senior with the Colts. We drafted Peyton Manning, but you're around the very best coaches and the very best players. And you learn from both. You learn from the coaches, but you also learn from the players. And, and um, so the, the experiences I was with Tom Moore, who was the offensive coordinator of the Colts. And Tom Moore is a guy that's been in the National Football League for decades. I mean, he, he coached um, with the Pittsburgh Steelers and, and, um, you know, worked with Lynn Swan and John Stallworth and Terry Bradshaw. And a lot of the things we did in Indianapolis, he did with, with the Steelers. And so, and, and he worked for Chuck Knoll and, and just there's so much knowledge that is passed down from coach to coach to player to coach that you benefit from that when you're around those people and Howard Mudd was our offensive line coach. And you're talking about two of the very best that's ever done it in the national football league. And so I really learned how to be a real receiver coach from Tom Moore. Tom Moore worked with John Stallworth and Lynn Swan. Much of what we did with the Colts, um, we did, Tom did with the Steelers. And so, you know, Lynn Swan played on the right, Stallworth played on the left, and they never switched sides. And so when we went to the Colts, Marvin Harrison played on the right, Reggie Wayne played on the left. And that was the first time I've ever been exposed to offensive football where the receivers didn't flip. And so that is something that's transpired into college football now, you know, Almost everybody does that in college now. And back then it was very rare. But Tom Moore did that way back in the 70s. And so it just exposed me to really a high level of offense, of philosophy. Um, and uh, we were no huddle then with, with, with the Colts. Peyton loved the no huddle. And Tom gave him a lot of freedom and leeway. That really shaped my my view of how to coach a quarterback and give the quarterback options to to make plays. And and we do a lot today in college here at Colorado State because of that influence that I had with Peyton Manning and Tom Moore and giving him the freedom to check and change plays. Um, and then I was with the Colts for four years, and then I went to the Oakland Raiders and Bill Callahan – uh, when Gruden got traded to Tampa, um, Bill became the head coach. And so then I got to work with, you know, Rich Gannon and Jerry Rice and Tim Brown and, and you know, pure West Coast offense um, where I really learned personnel and was was with Mark Tressman and he was the coordinator and saw how he – used all the pieces of the personnel that we had. I mean, we had Charlie Garner, we had, we had, we had Jerry Rice, we had Tim Brown, we had Jerry Porter, all those guys had to get the football. And so I really got immersed in how do you use the personnel that you have to spread the ball around and really put pressure on defenses. And so I really took those experience when I did come back to college and those influences that stayed with me till this day. Yeah. Now uh, I can only imagine how special of, uh, you know, a, a five year stint, six year stint that, that was, 
if you had to say it in one word, what 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 was that NFL experience like for those for those six years? You know, what did what was your takeaway? You know, what was you know the one the one thing that you learn in in professional football that's never left me is professionalism. Mm. You know, and a lot of people I, I think get get that word confused. But what being a pro is is being a pro is when you get up in the morning, it's your job to do your very best regardless of the circumstances. People don't care if you don't feel good. They don't care if you're sick. They don't care if you're having personal problems at home. They don't care. It's your job to be the very best. And, you know, I think one of the things that college coaches learn when they go to the NFL, nobody tells you what to do. Yeah. <laughs> you just got to figure it out. And they throw your ass in the deep end. And you're either going to swim or you don't swim. And I think that's a great learning experience for a coach, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, they threw me in a room with Marvin Harrison, and, and we got to figure this out. This is what our job is. <laughs> and so um, I think it, ha it makes you grow up really yeah. quickly as a coach. Um, and, and I think the other misnomer that people ask, you know, they ask, oh, what about pro football? You know, those guys must be hard to coach. They make millions of dollars. They probably don't want to listen. It's really not the case at all. You know, the, these guys make a great living, but the reason they're able to make a great living is because they have to perform at a high level. Yeah. And coaching helps them do that. And so uh, I had a great experience with the Colts and with Jim Mora and Bill Polian was the GM. Um, and then I had a great experience with the Raiders with, with Bill Callahan and Mark Tressman and, 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 and Al Davis, you know, I got a picture in my office of two coaches, Hayden Fry and Al Davis behind me. And they, I look at, they look at me every day. And those are probably the two biggest influences I have. And I love being around Al Davis. Al Davis, you know, people, he has a reputation and people either love him or they hate him. But I've never met a man that loved his football team more than Al Davis. And he loved every aspect of it, from player acquisition uh, to drafting kid players to trading for, for veteran players, for defense, for offense, for special teams. His whole life was the Oakland Raiders. And, you know, as a head coach, you know, my whole life is my team and my coaches. And so – I really learned a lot from from Coach Davis and and just being in charge of a whole football organization. I I tell you what, once again, just at, at these stops, I mean, just Mark Tressman. I mean, some of these names that that that, that you're mm -hmm. saying are just absolutely phenomenal. Now, um, all have these very very unique impacts on you. Just to kind of catch up, you you. You've been in Northern Iowa as a as a receiver coach. You've been in Wisconsin. You've been in Iowa State. You've been with the coach. You've been in, with the Oakland Raiders. Offensives all run very differently, right? I mean, all yeah. <laughs> different language. I spent some time in the West Coast offense, and I I know how that, you know how they can definitely mm -hmm. do that. Um, now we're about to transition to your first offensive coordinator job. What was you know what was your brain at, at this point in time in kind of developing an offense that you want to run? Um, yeah, you know what? You, just talk to us about that. So I left the Raiders and, and Bill Callahan became the head coach of Nebraska and Bill and I had had a long working relationship at Wisconsin and over the years and we were very close and, and so um, he asked me to come to Nebraska uh, and be his offense coordinator and so um, and we had just been at the Raiders together and, and we had been at Wisconsin together and and so I mean, we went to Nebraska to install a pro-style West Coast offense in a school that had traditionally run the option for decades. Yeah. And, and so that was just, it was just such a awesome opportunity to go to a great school with tremendous tradition and really install this pro-style attack that they've never had before. And so, you know, we had to go get a quarterback. We had to develop a quarterback. And that's what I always wanted to do as a coach. And so, um, you know, we went to Nebraska and, uh, 
I searched the country for a quarterback, and we brought in a JC guy named Zach Taylor. And Zach Taylor um, was the son of an Oklahoma football captain um, and grew up around football all his life. He was, he was, uh, he was in a junior college, uh, in Kansas. And, uh, you know, I went and interviewed him just like we did in the NFL. And I talked to him for about two hours and I'll never forget. I asked him a question and, and, and I just asked him, I said, uh, you know, Zach, I know what you love about football. And I said, what do you hate about football? And he paused for a second. And he looked me right in the eye and he goes, I hate losing. And when I heard him say that, I took my notepad like this and I folded it up and I said, we got the guy we want. And, 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 uh, you know, and now everybody knows Zach Taylor. He's the head coach of the Cincinnati Bengals. Yeah. But, um, you know, we just had the amazing years. You know, Zach ended up being the offensive player of the year. Um, we did take Nebraska to the championship game. We lost to a guy named Adrian Peterson in the Oklahoma Sooners. And, uh, but, you know, just had, you know, I had some great memories uh, at, at uh, Nebraska working with Coach Callahan and, and Zach Taylor. And, um, you know, and then that led to some more opportunities for me to move on as a coordinator. Yeah, you know, that's uh... – interesting time frame. Uh, I actually grew up a Nebraska fan, believe it or not. And, uh, you know, this was a big transition at this point in time, you know, from uh, like a few years ago, they're, they're playing for the national championship and won a couple in the nineties, you know, and, yep. and uh, at this point in time, I'm actually a player at Baylor. So I got beat by you guys up, up there at, in the, I forgot what they call the stadium over there, but uh, Memorial Stadium. Memorial <laughs> Stadium. Yeah. Yeah. I got, I beat by you guys up there. Now, uh, you know what? Kind of a tough question, especially for you. Kind of, kind of go back and and, and and think upon this. But like, this is your first time been an OC. I mean, and I mean that stadium is it's, its seats are filled. It's all red. I mean, it is a it is a party when it's a game there in uh, yeah. in Omaha uh, or Lincoln. Lincoln, I'm sorry, yeah. in, in Lincoln. Yeah. Uh, what what were what were some of the things that maybe was a little tough for you in that first year that you had to grow in in in, in yeah. get beyond? You know, I think I think the biggest challenge whenever you take over a new program is trying to build the confidence of the players. And, you know, number one, you got to have players that can do the things you ask them to do. You know, our first year at Nebraska, we had players that were recruited for the option, and um, we didn't get Zach to our second year. And so our first year had a lot of growing pains um, because it, it was about as drastic a change in offense that you could you could make. Yeah. Um, once we did get Zach in place, things started to happen, and that was really fun to see. You know, I think the biggest thing, and, and, and this is part of my philosophy in coaching quarterbacks, is that I just believe that playing quarterback is the hardest thing in, in football. And, you know, I feel like it's our job as coaches to totally prepare that guy for everything that's going to happen to him on game day. And there's no secrets between the quarterback and the play caller or the head coach. And so I just relish that relationship I had with Zach. Um, I think Zach has that same relationship with Burrow at Cincinnati, you know, and it's been really something to see him grow as a head coach. Um, but I think, I think the biggest thing is just, is just trying to instill that confidence in a group of players and it takes time. And, and, and so we started to see things grow our second year. I think we, we beat Michigan uh, in the Alamo bowl and uh, Zach played great, you know, our skill players, uh, started to really catch on. Our receivers really started to catch on. Um, and, uh, and then the following year, we played in the championship game and then played in the Cotton Bowl. But that was just great to see how that, that whole thing grew um, in that two years, three year span that I was there. But, but you gain confidence uh, in your kids. And it's really, it's really a marriage. I mean, you, 
you got to have a close relationship with with the guy that's behind the center, and his confidence has got to be lockstep with yours as as an offense. Yeah, and 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 so uh, after this time, you you go and be the OC quarterbacks coach at UCLA, and uh, I I just kind of want to kind of tie this back to a little bit earlier in your career where you were getting in this vehicle and you know driving all over the place just for some of that professional development opportunities. Were you were you doing any of this at this point in time? Now as the OC, you know, were you, were you looking at things differently? Maybe maybe visiting some other staffs and all that kind of stuff still. Yeah, we 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 um, we never stopped uh, visiting people. Um, and we were always looking for an edge. Um, and I think, and we still do it to this day. And I mean, we usually, we go visit people, you know, this time of year in February, we either bring somebody in or we go visit people. And, you know, as you get older and coaching and more experience, you develop relationships. And, you know, I've been really blessed. I've had some incredible mentors. Um, I really seek out older coaches that can really give me some perspective on things. Um, and, um, and that's always really important. You know, Steve Mariucci was one of those guys for me at that time, um, uh, in, in quarterback play, um, in, in offensive play. Um, but over the years, I've really learned to lean on veteran, veteran coaches that, you know, and Bruce Arians at that time, Bruce and I were with the, was with the Colts. Bruce, Bruce was coaching the quarterbacks at that time with Tom, and 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 Bruce and I always had a great relationship as well. And so, you know, I mentioned Mark Tressman, and so but all those relationships are important, yeah. and they help. You know, you can you can take things from them, and uh, even to this day, I mean, I have about three or four retired coaches that are just amazing to me. You know, um, uh, Al Groh is one of them. Uh, Al Groh, the great Jets coach and worked with Parcells and Belichick and was the head coach at Virginia and Wake Forest. And he's an amazing mentor to me. Uh, Jerry Glanville is, uh, is a real special relationship for me too. And, you know, he called me last year after the Colorado game, and we talk a couple times a week, every week now. And, um, you know, Chris Alt was that way for me at Nevada. Um, so, you know, veteran coaches that that show an interest and want to help young coach, younger coaches. Just, I just think those are those are things that you have to have those types of people that you can lean on and throw ideas off of and ask for perspective on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's awesome. You've taken advantage of that. And uh, obviously, it's helped you develop as a coach kind of throughout your profession and as you continue to do so. Um, you know, man, you've had such a tremendous career. Like I'm, I'm sitting here looking at the time trying to make sure I can get on my questions. So I'm probably gonna have to <laughs> skip through a little bit of the uh, of, of, of the time at Oklahoma. But I, that was a six year stint playing a national championship, uh, you know, wrote a book. I know it was a special time frame for you. Uh, yeah. What was kind of the, the big takeaway from, I guess, to, to tie it into a good question here, this is kind of a little bit of a sandwich where you where you coordinated for about four years and then you go yep. back to, you know, I, I know you're a pass game coordinator, but you're a little bit more of a position coach before you go into yep. a head coach. What, what was special about getting back to, you know, the, you know, the I, position? I, I was really, um, you know, I had, a, I had to make a career choice then. I, was at, I went to UCLA for a year. Uh, with Carl Durrell, and he was amazing uh, to work with. Um, and and we got let go after that year. Um, and then I had to make a decision. And and obviously, Bob Stoops was a college teammate of mine. He had won the national championship at Oklahoma. I had a lot of friends coaching there. Chuck Long and Jonathan Hayes were college teammates of mine. And uh, – and then I also had an opportunity uh, to go to A and M and and uh, work with Mike Sherman and, and coach quarterbacks. And so, um, you know, I ultimately chose to go to Oklahoma. I always wanted to coach with Bob. I always thought it would be amazing to be at that university. And so, um, you know, I was a pretty lucky guy. I, I coached with the Indianapolis Colts. I coached with 
at UCLA. I coached at the Oakland Raiders. I coached at Nebraska. I mean, those are some amazing places to coach. And so, you know, just the opportunity to go to Oklahoma and be with so many great players was just uh, amazing. And so I coached receivers, you know, but again, um, I was around uh, Kevin Wilson, you know, as the offense coordinator and Josh Heupel was the quarterback coach. And, you know, and Bob, I don't think Bob Stoops gets enough credit for being an innovative coach as, as a guy with a defensive background, but as a head coach, he was a, he was a trendsetter in college football. And, you know, he hired Mike Leach when he first got there. And, you know, that was a pretty uh, courageous thing to be at Oklahoma and to hire an air raid coach. And so, but because Bob had the courage to do that, he attracted all these incredible quarterbacks. And, um, you know, at the time, Bradford was the quarterback at OU. I had a background in the NFL to where we went no huddle at Indianapolis and we went no huddle at the Oakland Raiders. And so, those experiences really benefited me. And Kevin Wilson, it just came from Northwestern where they were a spread, no huddle running team. And so at that time, Bob came to us and he said, I think it's time that we go no huddle. And so, you know, in the 2008 season, you know, we had a, obviously a great football team, but we went no huddle uh, in, 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 you know, with under Kevin Wilson, and we end up breaking, you know, the all-time scoring record for offense, and played in the national championship, and fell a little bit short to to Tim Tebow and them. But but that was a great experience, and working with great players like Demarco Murray and Bradford, and all the great receivers we had. Absolutely, it was, and it was a lot of them. <laughs> it was a lot of good receivers that came <laughs> that, around that time frame. And then, uh, you know, so obviously you, you, after that time you go to Texas, you get times Arizona State, and then uh, this is this is when the, when the big call comes through. 2017, you get the opportunity to be the head coach in Nevada. Just how, how did you get on the radar to be a head coach at that point in time? How did you know you were ready? What was that process like? Yeah, you know, um, I just knew that I had a lot of experiences that benefited me. I've been around a lot of great coaches. You know, and, and, and I was a little bit older when I got my opportunity. And it's the one thing I always tell people. I think my experience in the NFL really affected me. And I just, I just, I always tried to be a pro. And I always tried to do the best job wherever I was and treat people right. And I just believed at the end of the day that that really mattered. Um, my experience at Texas was a great experience. You know, I, I ended up being the play caller there and uh, called plays for Charlie that year. And so, you know, I, I don't know what the stats are, but, you know, I've been a play caller at UCLA, been a play caller at Texas. Um, you know, I was a, a coordinator at, at Nebraska, and Bill called a lot of plays there. But there's not many people that can say that they – been in those leadership positions at those schools. Right. You know, I was a co-coordinator at Oklahoma as well. And so I just felt like all of those experiences, being in those high pressure situations um, at places where, that you were expected to win um, benefited me uh, when I got my opportunity to be a head coach. And I just think that it was that reputation of doing a good job for people that I worked for. Yeah. Is what, uh, gave me that opportunity at Nevada. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm happy you said that, Coach. And uh, this statement doesn't really need a response, I guess. But I, I was, I was definitely want to pinpoint that out. I think it's really special that in a lot of these places that you end up ended up at was based off relationships that you had with other people. And I always think that says a yeah. lot when guys are willing to be a teammate and say, you know what, uh, this guy needs to come uh, run my wide receiver group or be a coach and say, this guy needs to be my offensive coordinator. So it just says a lot. Clearly, you were making a, a, a very significant impact from a relationship standpoint with all these people well, that you interacted with. And I'll even, take, I'll even take that one step further, Mario. So when we were at Oklahoma, you know, we had been a drop-back passing team 
from when Leach was there and with Bradford. Um, and we played a, we played A&M in the Cotton Bowl. And there's a guy named Johnny Manziel and Johnny Manziel ran all over the place on us. And so one of the things we wanted to do is we wanted, uh, we had a kid named Trevor Knight and we wanted to get more involved in the quarterback run game. And so if you go back in your history books, um, you know, there was a guy named Colin Kaepernick who just left Nevada and went to the San Francisco 49ers. And there's a Hall of Fame coach named Chris Alt that had just retired. And so, you know, I went to Bob and I said, why don't we bring Chris Alt in and, and learn about the pistol and the quarterback run game? And because the Niners were huge then, Kaepernick was going to the Super Bowl and, um, Bob said, yeah, let's bring him in. And so we brought Coach Coach Alt in. We spent three days with him, and I was the one that did it. I called him. I invited him up. When he came, I picked him up at the hotel, at the airport, and then took him to his hotel, made sure he was good. And we just, we just began to have a relationship, and, and I, I just had a lot of respect for him because he was just a, a head coach and accomplished so much. And so, you know, that was around 2010 when that was going on. Right. And then seven years later, when the Nevada head coaching job opened up, Coach Alt was one of the guys that brought my name to the AD. And wow. that led to me getting the job. And that was that relationship Absolutely. just over a three-day period. And uh, it was just common respect for coaches. but But he remembered that. Yeah, he remembered me, and so I just think that's a great lesson for everybody. No uh, doubt. Go well, yeah, that definitely. I mean, that ties in kind of, kind of two emphasis points. The number one, the relationship thing, and then number two, just that you seeking, uh, you know, that professional development since you were a young coach. Obviously, uh, just kind of leads you into this, uh, you know, awesome opportunity to be a first time head coach. Now, once again, I'm I'm peeking at the time, coach. And I'm be respectful as I can here, so yes, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna leave you with two questions here. Uh, uh, th this question right here, it's, it's one of the most impressive things about this conversation that I'm finding is that every last one of these stops, I mean, you vividly remember the staffs there and their impact, these guys that, you know, <laughs> left their imprint on you. And uh, so now you got the opportunity to be, to, to be the one that puts together one of these staffs. What was, yeah. what was that process like putting together your first staff? And, and you can also <laughs> throw the Colorado state staff in there as well. Yeah. Well, and, 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 and I, I think that's a great question. You know, one of the things that I learned from Coach Fry, it's, it's all about the people. So the number one thing that I wanted when putting my staff together is that the quality that the coaches had to have was that they have sacrificed their career to help young people. And, and I was very fortunate to bring in people that were like-minded coaches like me. And, and I want to say this before we finish. I want to get this in, you know. Um, I had a great, uh, I had a great fortune of interviewing a coach from Indianapolis this past year. And the Indianapolis Colts have started a Tony Dungy legacy position with where they're hiring a, a young minority coach for a whole year. And that really impacted me. And so my wife and I, um, and, and this is part of my background as well. And this is a whole nother area, but my father was an athletic director at Michigan state. My father used to put together AFCA minority coaching fellowships where he would bring in Bill Walsh. He would bring in great coaches. Uh, he would bring in people that would just, uh, and, and, and simulate interviews. And my father had a real heart for helping minority coaches. Many of the current minority head coaches, James Franklin, Mike Loxley, um, uh, were all guys that were in his program, myself. Wow. Um, and so one of the things, and, and I just did this yesterday, was his birthday, but we're starting a Merritt Norvell minority fellowship position here at Colorado State. And my wife and I are funding it. And we're going to hire a young minority coach for a whole year to work with our staff. And, and I'm going to try to challenge a lot of other head coaches to do the same thing because 
getting started is the hardest thing for young coaches. You know, you asked me about how I got started. It was just kind of a luck of the draw and, and my coaches looking out for me. But I think we could even be more focused about giving those opportunities to young minority coaches. And so I'm really excited we can do that here at Colorado State. Coach, hats off to you for that, man. That's awesome. <laughs> that, that, that's like a whole – well, I didn't know that about your father, number one. And, I mean, that's kind of a whole whole separate deal I think that's worth worth talking about. Obviously, not right now as we're, as we're yeah, creeping absolutely. up to your next thing that you got. But hopefully we can – Get you back on at some point in time and visit some of these things a little bit more. Um, I would if you would if, if you ever want to talk about that, I'll just let me know. We'll we'll talk about it. Because I think that's something and especially, you know, we have a real shortage of in my path of of young African American quarterback coaches that can work on offense, that can call plays, that can uh work with the quarterbacks. And so that's something that I really want to help develop as well. Oh, coach, yeah, let's let's definitely visit on that. That's uh, uh, that's something I'm passionate about as well. Um, before I let you go here, coach, uh, like I said, there, I left some meat on the bone, unfortunately, but uh, <laughs> but but we, like I said, we can we can revisit some of this. Um, you were re- recently named to the AFCA Board of Trustees, representing the Mountain yeah. West. Uh, you know what does that mean to you, and what has the AFCA meant to you over the years? You know, I I spent my life with this game and this game has given me a lot. And uh, I think, you know, having the ability to take off your school hat and interact with amazing leaders from all over the country at every level, you know, you know, division one, division two, three, junior college, high school, and really try to use all the knowledge that I have to help make decisions on what's best for this game. You know, obviously this game has been so good to so many of us and we have so many people that love it. I want to, I want to help it go the right direction. And right now there's just so many issues in the game of football college that, you know, we don't know which way this is going to go. We want it to continue to grow in the right manner and all the great qualities that have taught me and, and the kids that I've seen come through, we want that to continue. So I just think we have a unique game. It's There's not many places in our culture where the guys can get the lessons that they learn in football. And I want to help continue that and, and give back. So it's a great honor for me to be a part of the Board of Trustees for the AFCA. And uh, I hope I can make a, an impact and help. Well, Coach, we're we're happy to have you on, and we appreciate your willingness to come on and support our organization. And uh, once again, I I for y'all that don't hear our pre pre podcast conversations, I told them it'd be about forty minutes, and we're sitting here at fifty six minutes, and I I still got, <laughs> I still got like twenty questions I want to ask. But uh, yeah, we had to do a part two at some point in time, Coach. Uh, I appreciate you, man. That that was so much fun, and uh, wishing you guys nothing but the best as kind of heading to spring ball and all that good stuff. And uh, hopefully, we can continue some of these uh, some of this dialogue at a later point. Yeah, anytime, Mario. Let me know. We'll do it again. Yes, I got a long career, so it takes you a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, a little bit longer than I thought. But, uh, yeah, it was it was fun, Coach. I appreciate you. All right. Thanks, Mario. I appreciate right. you. Thanks, Coach. Coach Com has been delivering tough headsets for tough teams for more than 31 years. It's why 97% of FBS teams in thousands of high schools across the country rely on Coach Com. Get the best for your team. Visit CoachCom.com for more info. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Inside the Headset, presented by Coach Com. If you'd like to learn more about this week's episode, head over to AFCA.com. There, you can access every episode and find corresponding show notes. Remember, you can catch every episode of Inside the Headset, presented by Coach Com, on wherever you get your podcasts, including Spotify, Apple, and YouTube. While you're there, we'd love for you to take a moment to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Your feedback helps us improve and grow. Keep up with the latest news by following us on social media. Connect with us at Inside the Headset and remember to tag us when you share your favorite episodes. For more updates on all things AFCA, be sure to follow the at We Are AFCA social media accounts. If you're not a part of the AFCA community yet, 
Visit AFCA.com to join thousands of NFL, college, and high school coaches nationwide and across the globe. Elevate your coaching game with an AFCA membership. You'll gain exclusive access to the annual AFCA convention, magazine, digital library, and AFCA insider email. Stay up to date with the latest stories and news on the AFCA website. More than just a convention, the AFCA offers continuous education, guidance, networking, and more. Celebrate the past and shape the future with the AFCA. It's about fostering exceptional coaches who create outstanding teams and even better individuals. Invest in your skills and make a lasting impact today by engaging with the AFCA. Your journey starts here.